Hello, my name is Anne Marie Harrington. I'm the Physician Relations Manager here at Allegheny Health Network St. Vincent Hospital. And I'm so glad you're here tonight joining us to hear Dr. Thomas Krebeck speak on updates in the diagnosis and treatment of gynecologic cancers. I'm pleased to introduce him today. Dr. Krebeck is the Medical Director of the Division of Gynecologic Oncology at the Allegheny Health Cancer Institute and is a renowned gynecologic cancer surgeon. His specialty is in providing personalized, high quality care to patients with ovarian, uterine, and other gynecologic cancers. He performs complex procedures using minimally invasive techniques. Dr. Krebeck's medical training was at Ohio State College of Medicine in Columbus, Ohio. He did his residency at David Grant Medical Center, Travis Air Force Base in California and his fellowship trained at both Walter Reed Army Medical Center, Washington, DC, and the National Cancer Institute in Rockville, Maryland. He is certified by the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology for Gynecologic Oncology and the American Board of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Dr. Krivax is located in Pittsburgh, Wexford, and Erie, and he cares for patients 18 years of age and older. Please help me welcome Dr. Thomas Krivak. Emery, thanks for the kind introduction. Um, thanks for everybody being here and everybody that's online as well. Um, what I want to talk about today is I um, want to try to answer some questions and, and, um, and, and, and try to change some thoughts with respect to uh, how people think about their cancer care, and then uh, give you an outlay of how I treat patients in, uh, in our program in G1 Oncology at, at, at AHN. And um, what I would say, if there's questions that come about, uh, go ahead. Uh, there's, there's no such thing as an interruption. It's uh, just ask a question at any time. Um, I am the division director at G1 Oncology at AHN, and I do have um, many good partners, Dr. Miller, Dr. Crafton, Dr. Nakayama, Dr. Morris, Dr. Wild. Um, are all my partners and you know we have many many outreach sites so uh, I'm not caring for you one of my partners and, and we, we try to do everything as a group and so um, we do a lot of, um, of conferences and we try to do uh, treat patients very similarly um, but again there may be some slight differences based upon um, biases. So for today we're going to talk a little bit about epidemiology and some basic clinical trial nomenclature. And then I do have some pictures of, of cancer, of like what we do in the, in the operating room. So uh, it's, they're, they're photos of, of, of actual surgical debulking. So if, if you're interested in that, uh, keep your eyes open. If you're not, you can go ahead and close your eyes. Um, screening, um, to me, I, I, when I left my fellowship in 2002, um, my, my goal was really to help develop a screening test for ovarian cancer. I, I really, uh, we looked at proteomics and all kinds of things when I was at the NCI, and I was hoping that uh, we would have a screening test, but we can't screen for all cancers. And so, you know, to me, we'll talk about screening, talk about genetic testing, talk about therapies such as PARP inhibition, immunotherapy, ADC is not ABC with me putting the D instead of the B, it's uh, antibody drug conjugate, which is a new novel way of medications that are being developed, and then cellular therapies, and then uh, conclusions and questions. And so really to kind of, to, to when we talk about clinical trials, phase one clinical trial, when, when you hear of a clinical trial, that's a phase one clinical trial. What that means is, is the medication that's being investigated in this trial shown some promise in the Petri dish, as well as within lab animals. And a phase one clinical trial is highly suggestive that it's going to work, but in that we're trying to find the safe dose. So we actually will treat three patients, look at the dosing, look at the side effects, treat three or four additional patients, look at the dose, look at the side effects, treat three or four additional patients. And when we hit what we call as toxicity, then we'll go back down a dose and make sure that that, that is a tolerable dose for those patients. So we'll look at that and then we'll say, okay, in this phase one clinical trial that we had 24 patients, what is the signal to move that into phase two? Phase two is how does this drug work? And there are certain levels of evidence that we've looked at in the past that will say, we need a response rate of X, we need a duration or response of Y in order for us to say that the medication is effective. So phase one is finding the dose of the medication, what is the, the tolerable dose? Phase two is 
how well does the drug work? And not all drugs of medications in phase two are gonna meet that bar to move on to phase three, which is let's compare two effective treatments. And the FDA in, in patients who have rare cancers will use phase two trials to rapidly develop novel medications for us to bring to the clinic for patients. And so you will see some medications get approved that may be withdrawn later on based upon further evidence. But when patients with cancer think about a clinical trial, a lot of times people are nervous about getting a placebo. In general, we don't do placebo controlled trials where we give somebody medication and somebody will not receive a medication when they have active cancer. There are some placebo controlled trials that we will do for patients who are in remission to see if further treatment works better than, than no treatment. But, but for the most part, we're not doing placebo controlled trials in that if you have a recurrence of your cancer and you have active disease, you are gonna get treated with a medication that we feel is effective. So I think that's one of the myths that we hear about um, with that is I don't wanna be on the placebo. And again, you know, we want our, our, our patients to, uh, to, to, to get the most effective therapies uh, for, for them. And so obviously we wanna limit uh, placebo as well. Um, and so the phase three trials, are those are the large trials that say, treatment A is very good, treatment B is very good, but which is better, treatment A or treatment B? And then sometimes phase three trials are just combining novel medications to see can we make the treatment work better. So to me, that's kind of the bottom line when you look at the basics of clinical trials. Now, there's a whole bunch of different ways of looking at this. If you get on Google, you can phase, find phase 1B expansion trials. You can find randomized phase 2 trials. There's a whole lot of nuances, but this is the basics. And so a lot of times people come to me and say, well, we want to be on a clinical trial, and they'll go come back, and they'll come back from an institution, and I'll see it's a phase 1 trial. And I know that we have effective medications Sometimes I'll say, hey, you know what, if this was a phase two or phase three trial, we should consider that. But this phase one trial, probably not the best since we have a, a whole litany of medications that are effective. So you, you will get some biases up, uh, uh, amongst that as you go through some of these um, clinical trial selections. But to me, that's what I wanted to highlight. And, and hopefully that makes, makes sense for folks. Um, and today in, in my talk too, I'll, I'll show some, some data from, uh, some from phase three trials as well. And so when you think about cancer, um, you know, it, it's an evolving process. So you have prevention and screening, normal function, uh, environment, family history are all going to play into to factors. And again, what are we thinking about? We, as a cancer doctor, I want to prevent cancer. So we want to do prophylactic surgery, remove the structure before it develops cancer. So you may be removing a normal over uterus or cervix. Some cancers have pre-malignant changes. Some cancers don't. You know, we're not convinced when I show this slide for ovarian cancer that there is a definite pre cancer change for ovarian cancer, but for breast cancer, you have atypia of the, uh, of the ducts. For cervical cancer, you have cervical dysplasia. For colon cancer, you have polyps as well as dysplasia. And then preclinical disease screening and then cancer. So when, when we think about how we want to develop our, our, our programs in, in the United States, as well as at AHN, you know, where can we affect a patient's journey? How can we really, in my mind, not treat somebody with cancer? How can we detect it early? Or identify that high risk population, and, and we, we've done uh, some of that, but uh, obviously we're, we're, we're not there yet because we still, unfortunately, have patients who develop cancer throughout the United States. So, cancer screening. Some some myths here. Uh, Pap smear and HPV testing is is a good screening test for cervical cancer. So, no doubt about that. What pap smears don't screen for is endometrial, ovarian, or fallopian tube cancer. So, I do see a lot of patients who come in and say, "I had a pap smear." Just six months ago, how did I develop my uterine cancer or ovarian cancer? Unfortunately, the pap smear is getting exfoliative cytology from, from the cervix or the endocervix or, or the vagina. It's not getting cells from the endometrium or the fallopian tube. Now, I will see a patient probably once every two to three years that had an abnormal pap smear, and that's how we detected their endometrial cancer or their ovarian cancer, but it's not a screening test. When you think of a screening test, think of a test that you want to have uh, you're screening a whole population. So you're going to have a lot of false positives, which means you, um, you're going to have patients who screen a test as positive, but don't have cancer because you want to limit the false negatives because you want to detect everybody that has cancer. So you're going to have a, a lot of false positives and the screening test then goes down to diagnostic tests. Okay. So if you don't have uh, a, an easy access to uh, some of these tissues such as the endometrium, the over the fallopian tube, it's hard to do a screening test because, um, you know, to biopsy everybody's uterus once a year would, would cause a lot of pain and discomfort. And then really the only access to the ovaries would be through laparoscopy or major surgery. So 
how about ultrasound and endometrial biopsy? Again, ultrasound can look at the ovaries, it can look at the uterus, but it's not looking at tissues underneath the microscope. Those can be used in a high risk population. So somebody who unfortunately may have had a mother or father who had uh, Lynch syndrome that had a genetic alteration passed on down to them, that patient at a certain time frame will start doing endometrial biopsies as well as ultrasounds to screen for endometrial cancer as well as, as, as ovarian cancer. Again, the ultrasound for ovarian cancer is really not that good. It's really looking at the uterus. The yearly pelvic exam is not a very good screening test, but to me, you're coming into the doctor's office. They're, they're, they're going through the healthcare maintenance. They're looking at laboratory studies. So to me, a, a, a pelvic exam does detect patients who have either large fibroids, growth, things of that sort. So it's a fairly inexpensive exam, but it's not a very detailed examination. So it's not uncommon for somebody to say to me, I had a pelvic exam eight months ago and everything was fine. How did I develop my cancer of the ovary or the uterus or something of that sort? A, a, a pelvic exam is not a good screening test, but I do think a yearly uh, well woman exam with a pelvic exam is, is, is a smart way to approach healthy living. Ovarian cancer screening with ultrasound and CA125 does not work. And I do have some studies that we'll kind of talk about that. Um, you know, uh, I can remember being in Texas when I was in the military, I was driving by, it's like a Rite Aid and they had check your thyroid, check your, your glucose level and check your CA125. And I started to get chest pain because a CA125 is not a good screening test. Um, young women can have high CA125s for many, many reasons, uh, normal menstruation, endometriosis. Uh, it's not a screening test whatsoever. And about one third of women with early stage ovarian cancer are not gonna have an elevated C125, so it can give a false sense of reassurance. There are certain populations, again, high-risk groups of patients, patients with strong family histories, genetic alterations such as BRCA mutations or other mutations within genes that predispose to ovarian cancer. We will screen those patients, again, it's an enriched population that has a higher incidence of cancer. So you're gonna have a more effective screening test for that. Um, but the bottom line is, is most of the studies have shown that CN125 and ultrasound are not very good screening uh, studies. So really what we need is we need additional population-based screening for patients with ovarian cancer as well as endometrial cancer. When I left my fellowship 2002, I thought for sure a woman would come into the gynecologist office give us a tube of blood, some urine, and a swish and spit in a cup, and we'd be able to classify their risks for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, tubal cancer, endometrial cancer, and cervical cancer without even having to do an examination. Um, unfortunately, that has yet to come about, but we're getting closer. This GRAIL um, is a test that's called an early detection test. And you may start to see this because, um, you know, in the United States, we are a healthcare system that's based upon companies and, 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 and development of, of, of tests and medications. This test is, is out there and um, it's recommended for patients over the age of 50. I shouldn't say recommended. The company promotes it as uh, for patients over the age 50 to detect cancers potentially at an early stage. And it's, it's, you give a tube of blood and what it does, it looks at what we call methylation patterns and methylation Think about, um, you can turn genes off um, by, by methylating them. So the lights in this room could go out by us flipping the switch. That would be like methylation, or the lights could go out in this room because there's a genetic defect within the, the structure of the electrical wiring. So the electricians would have to come back and rewire that. So methylation is turning off the switch, whereas the genetic alterations are, are inherited from mom, to, from, from, parents to offspring. So um, what GRAIL does is it looks at methylation patterns to help detect early stage cancer. The problem with GRAIL is um, it, it ranks cancers. It can say, you know, you're positive for one, two, or three, and it still misses about 50% of the cancers. So it's, it can give a false sense of reassurance. I think GRAIL has a place somewhere in screening, probably the high-risk population, possibly for patients who had cancer, and we want to follow them a little more closely. But unfortunately, we just do not know how to use this test just yet. Um, I think it's between $750 and $1,000 uh, for the test. So you can imagine getting that done yearly um, could be fairly expensive for everybody in the United States over the age of 50. For GRAIL? No. So I would say that this test, um, like if you went to the Mayo Clinic for the executive physical or something like that, you probably have pay people that will request that. There are some health systems that will promote doing the test, but then it comes back, does insurance cover it or not? Um, and to me, um, 
I have very mixed emotions about this. When I first saw the data, I thought this was pretty interesting. But when I really interrogated the data and saw that they still miss about half the cancers, I, I wasn't as enthusiastic. And then the other thing too is, is they have a very, very low false positive rate, but it, it could happen that I could order the test on a young woman and it comes back positive, but you know, the breast cancer is 35% likelihood, you know, ovarian cancer is 30% likelihood and pancreas cancer is 35%. W what do you do? You get a cat's case. So it could give a, a false sense of what's going on uh, with that. I do think it's the best that we have out there right now. And I do think that this is something that we're gonna build upon. So hopefully in the next five to 10 years, we'll have this type of early detection because I do think it's very, very important. And to me, um, methylation is one way of looking at things. Proteomics, so protein expression is another way of looking at things. So a lot of these technologies are, are hopefully going to be more specific for us to help detect uh, patients with cancer at a very early stage. Any other questions? Okay. So ovarian cancer, um, you know, what's the most important thing about ovarian cancer? In my opinion, um, you know, surgeons were arrogant. We think we're the most important people, um, but, 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 you know, you need a team. And so the surgery is important. Medical oncology is very important, but also you can see their expert pathology review. Um, you know, ovarian cancer, when you look at cancer in the United States, about 240,000 women with breast cancer, about 200,000 with lung, 180 or so to 200,000 with colon cancer. And you get to ovarian cancer, it's now under 20,000. It's 19,750. So breast cancer is 10 to 12 times more common. So when you have pathologists looking at rare things, um, it can become confusing. Um, and so to me, I always like having our pathologist here in Erie look at things and our pathologist in Pittsburgh look at things. So to me, it, it gives us a built-in second opinion because I do think uh, expert pathology review is very, very important, uh, not only in ovarian cancer, but in a lot of cancer. So to me, um, it's, it's a team. It's the surgeon, the medical oncologist, the pathologist, and then we get into tumor testing and genetic testing. So our genetic counselors, we're very fortunate at HN, we have the best genetic counselors going around. COVID really didn't do a whole lot of good but it did show us how to use telemedicine. I don't like doing telemedicine. I don't think it's good. I think I need to examine patients. I think I need to have face-to-face -face conversations, but your genetics counselors, they can telemedicine, send you out a box. You can swish and spit in, in, a, in a cup, send it off to the lab and they can, they can get your genetic results. So to me, I think the genetic counselors did a great job through COVID and we've really built on that so we can offer genetic counseling to patients. And then again, some novel therapies that we'll talk about, immunotherapy, PARP, antibody drug conjugates, targeted therapies looking at other molecular abnormalities within the tumors, and then uh, clinical trials with, with respect to ovarian cancer. And again, you can see here that unfortunately the majority of patients with ovarian cancer are going to be stage three, stage four, and you see some of the five-year survivals right around 40 to 50 percent. Again, it's a very chemosensitive disease. It's a disease that we need to use surgery and chemotherapy for, but again, it's, it's a virulent disease and that at times it wants to recur. What to make note of is that in 2021, this, this is about 20,100 or 20,500, 21,000 cases. So our number of ovarian cancer patients appear to be decreasing, which um, could be a couple things. One is, is genetic testing. And so we're taking out uh, patients, uterus, ovaries, and fallopian tubes who have a genetic abnormality have yet to develop ovarian cancer. Um, or we're using more OCPs to help um, decrease the ovarian cancer rates because oral contraceptives help uh, prevent ovarian cancer. Um, or it's just a, a, a a misnomer because of COVID and patients are starting to go back to the doctor. Now we're going to see the rate rise back up. So I'm very hopeful that it's a cascade testing effect because I probably do a risk reducing surgery uh, once or twice a month and risk reducing surgery means um, the patient in front of me does not have cancer, but has a genetic abnormality that places her at increased risk for ovarian tubal or endometrial cancer. And we're doing surgery before they develop cancer. Um, so to me, uh, this is where we're at with ovarian cancer with the epidemiology. Um, we are having more women live with ovarian cancer. The number of women uh, alive with ovarian cancer 20 years ago in the United States was probably right around 150 to 180,000. Now we're up approaching 250,000, which means we're starting to turn uh, this disease into a chronic illness. So patients are living much, much longer with this disease. And again, when you think about ovarian cancer as a process, how I really wanted to, to my career to grow is really to try to detect that pre-malignant change. And there's not a defined pre-malignant change in ovarian cancer or come up with a screening test. The bottom line is, is that CA125 um, ultrasounds are not very good. 
We don't know if ovarian cancer all starts in the ovary or does it start in the fallopian tube. The lining of the abdomen is lined by the peritoneum, and that's where we think that serosa is similar on the ovary as it is the, the lining. And so some people believe that there's a field effect with ovarian cancer. I think that one it doesn't explain everything. There's probably a field effect in certain patients, and there are certain patients that probably can be preventive. Um, but the bottom line is, is that there's a lot of challenges for us to develop a screening test for ovarian cancer, and this kind of highlights it. But you can see the genetics and the family history. We're really making some, some headway there. Um, I think when Angelina Jolie was on the cover of Time Magazine, she had a BRC mutation. She had breast cancer. She had risk reducing surgery for her. Uh, for, for, for her ovaries as well as breast. And, and that was, I think that, that, that made this seem like, wow, you know, if she can do it, other people can go ahead and get tested. So I think that there was a jump in genetic testing uh, after she had, uh, had done that. Um, but the bottom line is that when we think about ovarian cancer, most of our efforts are focused on treatment to improve our treatments for patients who have been afflicted with this disease. And so looking at ultrasounds, this is from the, uh, the UK and the UK has a really good system in that it's socialistic medicine, everybody can be registered and you can see MMS versus ultrasound versus overall. This kind of shows you the number of patients that went on this trial, 98,000 that, that were totally enrolled. So you can see in order for us to do screening tests, we need lots and lots of patients because again, the incidence of the disease, how often that disease occurs is gonna affect how well the screening test works. So in a low incidence of disease, such as, as ovarian cancer, you're gonna need a significant number of patients. And what you can see when you look at the, the MMS, which is ultrasound and CO125 versus the ultrasound only group, um, uh, you, what you could see is, is that the majority of the folks, 101,000 patients, the majority of folks did not have uh, a, a decrease in, in death from ovarian cancer. However, in my mind, you know, that's one way of looking at things. But the other thing is when you look at here, when you look at screen positive, looking at early stage versus advanced stage, you can see that we started to detect some patients at higher rates of, of early stage ovarian cancer. So to me, uh, I would even think of diagnosing a patient at stage 3A. 3C is where I'll show you the pictures of where patients have large volume cancer. If I could diagnose somebody at stage 3A where they have microscopic cancer uh, in, in the upper abdomen, those patients seem to have a higher curability rate and do very, very well. I actually would think that that's a positive test. That's where the clinicians disagree with the FDA. Um, and, and so to me, what I think and what the FDA thinks at times are at odds, uh, and the FDA obviously is the ruling body, so we have to go with them. But the bottom line is, is that uh, I have every right to disagree with them. And so at times we will screen patients and that's why I will offer screening to high risk subgroups based upon this data. But again, if you were to go across like uh, the you know, state of Pennsylvania, they would not endorse this because of the FDA saying that this was not, not positive. So Gilda Radner, does, Gilda Radner, do you guys know Gilda Radner? Yeah, so Saturday Night Live, I was actually watching Saturday Night Live skits on YouTube last night on my phone in the hotel room. So I just, I think the old Saturday Night Lives are so much better. I don't know if you all watch Saturday Night Live, but today's Saturday Night Live is just not that funny. But um, Gilda Radner, uh, Gene Wilder, she was afflicted. She had ovarian cancer. She kind of brought uh, to, to the, the forefront that this is a terrible disease. Um, you know, we, we need to do better. There was absolutely no research into this area. In the 70s, care for women uh, for ovarian cancer was just not uh, very good. Uh, Gilda Radner helped uh, change that and, and started bringing uh, research money in as well as awareness for this. And then looking at, at, at the, the, the genetic alterations here, again, looking at, you know, developing an ovarian cancer registry, ovarian cancer and most cancers occur de novo in that patient. So sporadic cancer requires two mutations. So you have two copies of each gene and you have to knock out both genes before you develop cancer. And somebody who has a BRCA mutation or a mutation, you only need to knock out one of the copies because one of the copies is, is non-functional. So to me, that's why when you look at women who have some genetic alterations, not every woman with a genetic alteration develops cancer. It's at a much higher rate, but not everybody, because again, you still have the one uh, functioning gene. And when we look at patients who come in and see us, probably about 80% will have what's called the sporadic cancer, which means it happened in them. You don't have to have a family history. About 20% will be family history when you sit down and talk about it. Like I saw a patient earlier today who had three sisters with endometrial cancer and a mother who had endometrial cancer and colon cancer, which is highly suggestive of, 
a familiar predisposition to uterine cancer, which is Lynch syndrome, which is colon and uterine, as well as a little bit of ovarian. So that patient is going to need to be uh, genetically tested for Lynch syndrome uh, uh, moving forward. And it may help benefit her children uh, if she would have some type of genetic alteration. So we have a bunch of uh, guidelines where we try to help kind of standardize our practice, germline and somatic tumor testing for ovarian cancer. So when you see the doctor, we're going to talk to you about chemotherapy. We're going to talk about surgery. We're going to talk about genetics. We're going to talk about, should you see genetic cancer? We're going to test the tumor as well. And with that, ASCO, American Society of Clinical Oncologists, kind of puts together some guidelines. So does Society of Gynecologic Oncology and the NCCN. So there are numerous societies that will put out these guidelines. But the bottom line is, is that anybody with ovarian cancer should be tested um, for a genetic predisposition if they desire. And again, we can't force this on patients, but what I tell patients is, if we find out if there's a genetic cause that will affect their treatment, we will look at certain medications and it will affect that cascade testing. And what I mean by that is, is say, um, the patient has a genetic alteration, her sisters then can be tested and brothers. And if any of the sisters would test positive who don't have cancer and they have a genetic alteration, you can do risk reducing surgery on them as well as the children. So men can harbor genetic alterations that predispose their daughters to ovarian cancer. So, you know, we thought things skipped a generation. It wasn't, it was just hidden within the male and that they could pass off a uh, genetic alteration to their daughter. So to me uh, allows further testing so we can potentially do risk reducing surgery and what you can also do is we have a, a great onco fertility program that, um, again, this is all based upon patient desires. If um, a, a patient would have a BRCA mutation, so say like I see a daughter who's 28 years young, whose mother unfortunately passed away from ovarian cancer at age 67, who has a BRCA carrier, and the daughter has a BRCA mutation, but she hasn't started her family, an option would be for her and her partner to have in vitro fertilization and they can to test the embryos to see if there's a genetic alteration in those embryos that potentially could predispose the uh, baby to, to uh, uh, ovarian cancer. So um, you could say, test the embryos and please only transfer the embryos that do not have the genetic alteration. Again, it's not sex selection or anything like that. It's looking for that specific alteration. And, and again, that has really just come about in the last six to eight years. Uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2 were discovered in the mid to late 90s. And so we're just learning, uh, you know, genetic, um, genetic information at this time. It's, you know, I'm a sports guy. So we're at the three to five yard line with 95 to 97 yards to go. And if Matt Canada is our offensive coordinator, we'll never get there. But um, so needless to say, um, there's lots of genetic alterations. We talked a lot about BRCA1 and BRCA2, but what you can see here is that there's P53 mutations the RAD, RAD mutations, PAL-B mutations, NBN. So it's not uncommon for a patient to come in and see me and say, I have a BRCA mutation. When they really don't, they may have a BRIP mutation, which does carry the same, doesn't carry the same. It does carry an increased risk for ovarian cancer and that patient should undergo risk-reducing surgery, but not all of these genetic alterations will predispose you to development of cancer. So when I see a patient who says they have a BRCA mutation, I always want to get a copy of that, that report to make sure that it was a good reputable lab and to make sure it was a BRCA mutation. I probably see a patient or two per year who's been told they have a BRCA mutation. They need a hysterectomy and their herbs removed. And when I get a copy of the report, they do not have a BRCA mutation. They have some other genetic alteration that has nothing to do with ovarian cancer. And some actually have no genetic alterations. The physician just misinterpreted the report. So to me, I know that sounds scary, but it's always one of those kind of things. Um, you know, trust, but verify, uh, always listen to my patients. But when I, before I do a surgery on a young woman, that's going to be risk reducing. I want to copy the report. I want to make sure it's done by a, a reputable lab. Um, you know, the, what's that 21 and me or me and 21. What's the, what are those? There we go. So, so people will get a genetic alteration that may be positive there. I would never do a risk reducing surgery based off that. I would have them see our genetic counselors and confirm that mutation because there are mutations in many genes that have absolutely zero effect on that genetic function. So there can be mutations that are called polymorphisms, which means it's just a normal genetic variant, um, but it is a genetic variant. It has nothing to do with function. So I would want to confirm that before I, I would do any type of surgery. And this shows you how far we've come here. Um, these, uh, this gentleman here, Dr. Burchuk, he's at Duke um, and, um, you can see that's dated 1994. I think there's a lot to be said about this. This is a hand-typed letter. So it's 1994, no email, because this is coming from England to Duke. This Dr. Lancaster, 
I think he at one point worked for Marriott. He may have worked for GSK at one point, but he was a fellow at Duke. So at first he was a scientist, communicated with a surgical oncologist. You can see the, the British gynae oncology. Um, but these were two gentlemen whose labs were intimately involved with the discovery of BRC mutations. And this is how they did it. This SSFCP is how we used to do genetic testing where you'd have to have a lot of DNA and you'd test everything. Now we have gene probes that, that can look at this. So uh, to me, you can see here, I'm excited about getting my hands on more DNA from this family as they're trying to discover patients who had a strong family history to come back and look at these genes. What probably used to take five years in research can now probably be done in, in, in two to three months with the genetic uh, testing that we have in the high throughput uh, uh, machines that can now carry out this, this, this genetic testing. The amount of DNA that we need uh, is so minimal compared to how it used to be that, that we can do this. But um, I, I had the fortunate uh, experience of working with Dr. Burchuk uh, on a couple of research projects and um, he's truly a, a brilliant scientist and we're fortunate to have him caring for women. And Dr. Lancaster has really done a lot to help women with ovarian cancer. But I think there's a lot to be said there. So BRC1 and 2, the tumor suppressor gene. So think about it puts the brakes on. So cells start dividing too rapidly. It kills those cells. It, it puts the brakes on. It's within the DNA repair pathway. And again, mutations increase cancer generally in adulthood. So if there's a positive genetic alteration, when should we have um, the, 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 the children tested? Should it be at age 18, 21, 24? I think that's a very personal and family thing. Most genetic counselors won't do it till age 18 because again, that person, that patient's not going to develop ovarian cancer at age 18 or 19. It's generally, in my mind, 35, 40, when we start to look at, at increased risk for these folks. And again, there's other cancer sites, prostate, pancreas, melanoma, male breast. Um, so, you know, we talked about GRAIL, the methylation test. Um, at some point, it'd be nice to have something that can kind of help delineate this. Uh, but, but the bottom line is, is patients who have a BRCA1 or 2 mutation or an increased risk for breast cancer, ovarian cancer, pancreas cancer, male breast cancer as well, prostate cancer. So to me, we need to think about those and, and how we may be able to detect those cancers at an earlier stage. So we talked about uh, BRCA1 and BRCA2, and I showed you the, the, the other genes that were involved. And what you can see here is you may hear this, this term called HRD or hom homologous recombination repair. Um, to me, when I see a patient with ovarian cancer, I'm testing their, 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 their spit, the, the germline DNA. So they're going to swish and spit. And then I'm also going to test the tumor because the tumor is going to have genetic alterations that may affect how we want to treat some of these patients. And again, not just how we want to treat them, but how we're designing our clinical trials which is much more exciting now and much more complex now than it was 20 to 25 years ago, how we have to look at all these genetic abnormalities, all these potential biomarkers to help develop personal therapy. So to me, we've come a long way, but we still have a long way to go. So you may hear some of these, uh, the, these types of, of terminology, but um, you can test for BRCA1 and BRCA2 in the tumor as well as in, in, in the germline. And again, th those are different. You may have a tumor mutation, but you don't have it in the germline which means it's not in all your cells, so you're not gonna pass it on from mom and dad to, to, to kids. Any questions about genetic testing, tumor testing for ovarian cancer? Okay, and then you can see here um, the rapid development of medications. Um, again, in the 70s, there really wasn't a whole lot going on with ovarian cancer, and then you can see most recently, uh, really in the last five years, and again, there's even more medications. Um, that, 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 that can be on here, but we really increase the number of medications for our patients that can help um, prolong their, 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 their cancer-free time frame, as well as hopefully uh, equate into higher cure rates for our folks. But you can see that this is, this is a lot to digest. So the reason why I bring this up is, is there's a lot of medications. So that's why we're seeing patients live longer. But again, remember I talked about a team, it takes a team to care for our patients. You know, you need your medical oncologist, your surgical oncologist, um, because there's a lot of things going on here. And so I think having a built-in second opinion, you know, to me, um, this is when we talk about our patients, when we talk about patients at tumor board, you see that uh, where you have, uh, you know, those kind of things with, with these TV commercials, we do, we talk about a lot of our patients and also for us to develop our clinical trials ongoing, because, you know, if you're being treated by a doctor who reads a textbook, um, you need another doctor. Um, if you're being treated by a doctor who treats you from a journal article, you're, you're pretty good. You're in good shape. Um, if you get treated by a doctor who goes to these meetings and treats you before the publications, 
um, that's where you want to be. And, and that's where, you know, we're, we're at AHM, you know, we are trying to treat patients on trials. So we are changing the standard of care for, 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 for these women and making sure patients do much better and giving everybody an opportunity to, to be as aggressive as they want to be with their treatments. And so these are some of the decision trees that we have to make as we go through our patients with ovarian cancer. And this is somebody who comes in and sees me. What do we need to think about? Germline tumor testing, we need to think about decision one, do we give chemotherapy first or do we do surgery first? Decision two, you know, how long are we gonna do the chemotherapy? What's the frontline chemotherapy? Do we add uh, certain medications? And then decision number three, is how we're going to do our maintenance treatment. So, you know, what I tell everybody is we want to get rid of all the cancer. We want you to be in remission. Remission is no events of cancer by blood test, C125, by CT scan and by physical exam. And then we want to prevent that cancer from coming back. And so to me, that's where my biggest bias is, as you can see, maintenance therapy, and that I think everybody should undergo some form of treatment, whether it's an oral medication, uh, IV medication, or a combination of those oral and IV medications. So this is probably going to expand even more uh, as some of the clinical trials read out. Here. So, so um, we don't have a screening test for ovarian cancer. So looking for symptoms, bloating, irregular bleeding, um, th those types of symptoms, you, you know, early, you're eating in your early satiety. Uh, those are things, but there's nothing that can guarantee. Not, not, not at this point, physical exam by, by seeing the gynecologist, um, you know, once a year or every other year, but, but you're absolutely right now, if you have a strong family history, if there's genetic alteration, then there's a reason for folks to go in and consider doing surgery. But, um, you know, the, uh, yeah, I, it, it's a very difficult decision. Uh, I think, you know, you know, I was in California uh, in the military and some of the physicians at like UCSF and UCLA, very good institutions, would say the only reason for ovaries to come out is if they have cancer on them. Um, I'm not so sure if that's a good, good way of thinking, but they're smart people and that's what they tell their patients. Um, I don't believe that, but I'm a guy. And so some people think I'm biased because I'm a guy. I would say um, I'm a guy that's a cancer doctor. And so, you know, I wanna do what's best for women but you know, everybody has their biases as well. So, um, but there's nothing I can say or do that would say you, you're definitely a-okay, except the risk of ovarian cancer is pretty low. It's about 1.5% to live into age 70. N no, no, but, but you know, it's, it's one of those kind of things that, you know, I think senior gynecologist or your PCP and see what they have to say, I think is, 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 is good. And I also do think, you know, getting a yearly exam is important. So that's like, that's like three degrees of separation. So I would say that's a third or a fourth degree type of, of, and so that would have no, no significant change. When we start to see two or three first degree relatives with breast and ovarian cancer, I think your risk goes up to about 5%. So one and a half percent to 5%. So that's about three times elevated. That's when a lot of us will do risk reducing surgery. Um, you know, to me, I think part of being a, a, a surgeon is, is knowing the data and communicating that to, to patients, but it's also to make them feel comfortable with their decisions. So have I ever done it because uh, a daughter saw her mother pass away from ovarian cancer and she doesn't want to see that in herself? Yes, I've, I've done that. A first degree, one first degree relative probably takes it from one and a half percent up to probably maybe 2%. Um, so and, and hopefully in the next you know five or 10 years, we'll be able to get better information for you. Any other questions? So to me, this is great that we have all these decision trees because in the last 20 years, I see patients doing much better because we've changed how we've done timing of our surgery. We've changed how we've done our chemotherapy and we've added maintenance treatment. And to me, um, it's a huge difference from me finishing my fellowship in 2002 to caring for a patient today. And I've changed how I care for a patient today um, is different than it was three years ago. Um, and so to me, um, I think that we're making really good, really good progress. So again, um, utilization of long-term maintenance therapies, medications such as Zajula or Lamparza, Alaprib or Naraprib. Again, I think that those are very, very important medications for, for patients who have 
HRD tumors who have BRCA mutations, as well as for patients who have no genetic abnormality. Antigenic therapy is the bevacizumab. To me, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a big believer in this medication. I think this medication potentiates a lot of other chemotherapies. Timing of surgery, I think is important. You know, when I was a young doctor, we operated on everybody at, the, at their initial diagnosis. And I don't think that was very smart because at times we couldn't get rid of all the cancer. They had a long delay into starting chemotherapy. And I think to get your best outcomes, it's a combination of surgery, chemotherapy, and maintenance. And there's no doubt about it that genetic testing and tumor testing is tremendously important for all of these patients. And again, NCCN guidelines. So you saw ASCO guidelines. This is the NCCN guidelines. And what you can see here is that you can see where it says, say, observation for certain subgroups. But to me, if you have a BRCA mutation, um, uh, you definitely should get a PARP inhibitor. However, I kind of believe all patients with advanced stage ovarian cancer should be treated with maintenance therapy. Um, not everybody in my group that practices, practices the same. There are some patients that may not be offered that. That doesn't mean anything's wrong. But my bias is, is that um, you're going to get chemotherapy, surgery, chemotherapy, and then some type of maintenance treatment, whether it's an IV medication or oral medication or combination. So where do we need to go? We need to target new pathways. How are we going to find those new pathways is through doing genetic testing and tumor testing. We want to combine some of these biologic agents uh, to try to help block pathways simultaneously. And again, combining some of our chemotherapy with targeted therapy. Looking at what studies we have going on, we have PARP inhibitors for BRCA. We block multiple pathways synonymously. We had some viral cellular therapy with chemotherapy uh, going on. And then looking at immunotherapy. Um, Immunotherapy by itself has not worked out very well for ovarian cancer. However, a, a clinical trial that was recently reported at ASCO did show that immunotherapy combined with a PARP inhibitor and in certain subgroups of patients may be effective in helping preventing cancer from recurring. And so looking at some of these ongoing trials, um, the first trial, again, looks at standard chemotherapy and then looked at a combination of different uh, combinations of using immunotherapy with antigenic therapy with a PARP inhibitor. So there were some patients who were getting chemotherapy with two medications, and then the maintenance treatment or the long-term treatment for two to three years was three medications, and they were all biologic therapies. The DOO trial, again, combination of immunotherapy, a different PARP, and angiogenic therapy, again, looking at different combinations of medications. This DOO trial had its initial readout. This was the one that was read out at ASCO, which is a large cancer meeting in the summer in Chicago. Um, in, in one certain segment of the patients using combination immunotherapy with PARP may be a signal for us to, to look at that as well. Immunotherapy or VBL111 is a cellular therapy that was combined with Taxol. Unfortunately, in ovarian cancer, we've had four or five recent trials that read out that the medications didn't meet a certain standard, so they no longer went further development. So they're in that phase two and not going on to further development into further phase two or phase three. VBL111 was one of those. Antibody drug conjugates are, are, are kind of um, uh, very exciting right now. Uh, I think there's a lot of exciting things, but antibody drug conjugates, where you have an antibody that has a linker that has a drug and that antibody targets a specific antibody on the tumor cell. And theoretically it should come attached to the tumor cell, get engulfed into the tumor cell. So the chemotherapy is delivered right inside the cell and you should have higher uh, kill rate um, with that. Um, again, um, there's how medications work and there's how we say they work. There's probably similarities, but dissimilarities, um, uh, but antibody drug conjugates look like they're gonna be very helpful in ovarian cancer, possibly endometrial cancer as well as possible cervical cancer. And so that's where we're going um, with ovarian cancer. And again, there's numerous other clinical trials uh, going on, but this is a patient here who has, um, a normal appearing uterus here. Her ovary is tucked right here, this little white area. And this is a normal fallopian tube. And this is a large tumor of the left ovary. And so that's like a patient who has an early stage ovarian cancer. And then this here, um, which you can see, this is much different than that, uh, in that you can see all these little speckles here. These are all tumor implants. And so ovarian cancer at times can be uh, confined to the ovary. Uh, or it can spread kind of like if I would take a, a, a handful of sand and throw it within the abdomen and have uh, cancer spread throughout the abdomen. And then when we say that we want to remove all the tumor, uh, this is a, a picture of, of a surgery that, that we completed and that you can see the colons here. So we had to remove part of the colon. You can see the vaginas down here. This is the arteries and veins going to the left leg, right leg. And you can see we basically removed all those structures 
um, that, that were in the pelvis. Um, obviously this patient still has her bladder and we're gonna connect the rectum back up, but this is what it looks like after we removed all the cancer. And a surgery like this typically takes between uh, three and five hours. But that's the goal is to try to get rid of all the cancer that we can see or feel with that um, uh, for, for patients with ovarian cancer. Any, any questions about ovarian cancer before we move on to, to uterine cancer? Okay. So uterine cancer. Uterine cancer is um, uh, much more common than, than ovarian cancer. It's, it's right around um, 64, 65,000. Uh, you need to see uh, a surgeon so you can have appropriate staging. Expert pathology review is very, very important because there's many different types of uh, endometrial cancer. Tumor testing and genetic testing, again, are important for patients with endometrial cancer. And again, novel therapies, immunotherapy um, is very, very important. I'll show you slides from a recent trial that was presented. And then antibody drug conjugates as well as targeted therapies are important. And we do have ongoing clinical trials with patients with uterine cancer, whether it's upfront or recurrent. And the, what's disappointing is, is that when I graduated fellowship in, it's disappointing because my fellowship graduation is not even on the slide, but when you go back to 2002, it's about 4,500 patients passed away with endometrial cancer per year, and now we're eclipsing 10,000. So it's a cancer that we saw the, the rate go up. Ovarian cancer has been steady, but, but declining a little bit. And you can see the number of patients with endometrial cancer is up, uh, up over 60,000 per year. When you think about endometrial cancer, Chemo prevention, just like birth control pills help prevent ovarian cancer by uh, uh, decreasing ovulation, birth control pills are typically progesterone dominant. And so that's uh, actually going to help prevent endometrial cancer. So again, you can do some chemo prevention. There is some genetics. Uh, we talked about Lynch syndrome uh, for, for some of these patients. And again, prophylactic surgery. Um, I had a patient who was 42 years young, who I did risk reducing surgery on just about three, um, three weeks ago. We thought she had precancerous, but she actually had an early stage cancer at the time, uh, time of surgery. So again, the goal for genetics is to remove the normal or in a pre-malignant uh, type of, of abnormality. Um, but the bottom line is, is that um, if you develop uterine cancer, we have lots of effective therapies for that. And again, surgery is uh, a, an important role. Screening for endometrial cancer. You saw that I said that pap smears weren't, weren't a, an effective screening test. Patients who we screen for endometrial cancer are the patients who have a, a, a genetic predisposition or a strong family history. And some people think that we should do an endometrial biopsy yearly starting after the age 40. I think endometrial cancer is very complex. The different genetic alterations will place you at different risk categories for endometrial cancer as well as endometrial and ovarian cancer. There are some abnormalities that place you as high as 10 to 15% chance of developing ovarian cancer. And those patients um, a little more aggressive with, with surgery and, and less with, with screening. So how do we treat patients with endometrial cancer? It's based upon the stage where the cancer has gone, histologic subtype, high-grade serous cancer is worse than endometrioid type. And then again, we're doing a lot of this molecular testing. And again, I, I think that there's gonna come a time frame where we look more at the molecular uh, uh, concoction of a tumor than the actual stage. Upfront sur surgery, uh, upfront therapy is surgery with possibly adjuvant therapy and then um, for stage one and two, that can be surgery, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or combination. What I tell people is it's usually an insurance policy. I tell you surgery went well, there was no cancer in the lymph nodes, everything was confined to the uterus, but your risk of recurrence is 10 to 15%. If we give you a little bit of radiation treatments as an insurance policy, it may decrease it down to five to 6%. So endometrial cancer, we'd sometimes recommend therapy when there's no disease based upon risk uh, stratification. And again, for advanced stage disease, um, fairly complex in that do you have residual cancer before are you not a surgical candidate are you getting chemotherapy surgery and then chemotherapy like ovarian cancer and again tumor testing is very important to look at the, some of the genetics of the tumor again why is that it may allow for tailored treatment and again identify family members who are at increased risk of ovarian cancer or colon cancer immunotherapy is very very important and again i'm going to show some slides about uh, the most recent clinical trials with respect to that so how does immunotherapy work so, you know, we all have circulating tumor cells in our body. Uh, think about um, the, the, the cancer cell is the quarterback and you have the offensive line that kind of blocks everybody. And so if you have a really good offensive line, the defense can't get to the quarterback to, to, to get rid of the cancer cell. What immunotherapy does is it kind of wipes out that offensive line and kind of programs your natural cells to be able to go attack that cancer cell. So one of the interesting things about chemo or immunotherapy is 
we really don't know how long to treat patients. Do they need it for six months, one year, two years, three years? We really don't because there's probably a, a turning on of that immune system that once the immune system's turned on, a patient's going to do fine. There are probably some patients' immune system who need that constant stimulation and some patients who may need it just when the cancer recurs. We, we just don't know. But, but the bottom line is, is it, it kind of immunotherapy will help kind of get rid of those blockers and, and be able to have your natural killer T cells get to the, uh, to get to the cancer. And how does chemotherapy help immunotherapy? Well, you want to have your, your cancer cell look the most abnormal. So your natural immune system will go over and destroy it. And we think that the addition of chemotherapy or the addition of radiation therapy can make those cells look more abnormal. So your immune system will, will kind of function at a higher level to come destroy those cells. So that's why when we look at cervical cancer, sometimes we do radiation therapy and immunotherapy. Um, and sometimes we'll do chemotherapy and immunotherapy and with endometrial cancer, chemotherapy as well as with immunotherapy. So this is a large trial that was presented at our Society of Gynecologic Oncology as well as the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And it's a combination of chemotherapy with immunotherapy. And I wanna let you know how we think as clinicians, how we design these trials and how we kind of implement these trials. So again, dostartlimab is a medication that's an immunotherapy used to treat endometrial cancer. We did the phase two trial using the immunotherapy alone in patients with endometrial cancer, and it had very good response. So it was a phase two trial, recurrent setting, and it looked very good. So then we said, well, let's combine this with chemotherapy and use it in the initial uh, stages, in the initial diagnosis, or when those patients recur, and combine that with chemotherapy. And some people are gonna get chemotherapy, which is the standard of care, and some people are gonna get chemotherapy with immunotherapy, which is the hypothesis. So you can see, we kind of take our clinical trials, we take how patients do, we take what we've done for a while, and we're now merging them into, into a new study. And so this RUBY trial was presented, and you can see here it's carboplatinum paclitaxel with dostartlimab, okay? Or it was carboplatinum and paclitaxel with placebo. And this is what patients would get. So if you're going into anybody's office that didn't have any clinical trials, this is what they would give you. But if you came into an office that had clinical trials and you said, hey, I want to try this, you can potentially half the patients are going to get the immunotherapy with the chemotherapy. And then you can see here afterwards, placebo versus continued immunotherapy. And these are the things that we look at. And what patients really want to know is, am I going to get better with this medication? And then when I say, well, if I get better, do I have a decreased quality of life? And, and again, we as clinicians, that's what we want to do. And so what you can see here, this is a large trial. This is a phase three trial. So we had phase one, phase two, phase three. We said phase three trial, large trial. You can see it's 500 patients. And again, half the patients get chemotherapy with immunotherapy and half the patients get chemotherapy alone. And then we look at certain subgroups and you can see here that we look at MMR deficient. Uh, and why would you say, why would we look at that? Because MMR deficient is a molecular alteration in the tumor that's highly suggestive that the immunotherapy is going to work better. So we can look at different subgroups to try to say, is it going to work better in one subgroup? Or is it going to work better in another subgroup? And you can see there's all these things that we look at, stage three, stage four, or recurrent. And so you can see when we look at these patients, we want to know where they're at. So when we go through and we look at how these medications or combination of medications may affect an outcome, we want to make sure that it's similar between the two treatment groups, as well as how can we take the study and bring it back into our clinics to, to practice. And then we also want to look at, are we including everybody Caucasians, African-Americans, people who are sick, people who aren't sick, you know, looking at their performance status. And then again, you heard me talk about the different subtypes of cancer. And you can see here, here's a bunch of different subtypes of cancer that are all considered to be endometrial cancer. So you can see it's a very kind of complex thing and how we look at these uh, patients and how we look at the subgroups and how we want to make sure that, that, that all are represented. And then this is a, what we call a, a, a survival curve. And, and you want to be on the up top line because this means that you're doing better. This means that you're doing worse. And so what you can see in this is, is that um, patients who are treated with chemotherapy and immunotherapy are in this upper bar. And so they did better than people who were treated with chemotherapy without immunotherapy. And so to me, you know, when you look at this, this is a pretty significant difference um, between the two between the two groups of patients. So to me, that tells us that this medication and combination of medications works. And then we have to say, okay, what about the quality of life? And so when you look at quality of life and you look at the, the averages, basically this is chemotherapy with immunotherapy and this is chemotherapy alone. Your patients with chemotherapy and immunotherapy did not have a decrease in quality of life. And some people think you actually have an increased quality of life because you're going longer being cancer-free. And so to me, uh, with that 
We want to look at our goals of a clinical trial. Do we improve patients' outcomes by having them survive longer? Yes. Do we decrease their quality of life? No, we may be increasing their quality of life. So that's how we look at a clinical trial and how we bring it from the pharmaceutical company and our NCI developing the trials to how we bring it into our clinic and offer it to patients to what patients can go on and how we get the results, okay? Because I was at the meetings that presented these and immediately we had the research paper so we could start changing how we treated our patients differently uh, for this. And this is shows you how many investigators, this isn't patients, these are physicians at their institutions that had this clinical trial open. And you can see that it was international trial. So you have people from Denmark um, and then again, Canada, USA, Poland, Turkey, the UK. So this is an international trial. Some of these patients that have these rare diseases such as endometrial cancer and ovarian cancer, um, we need to have international trials to be able to be able to change the standard of care. And again, um, this is the United States here, USA. So if you look down here, uh, let's see here. Is there anybody from from AHN on this. There we go, Dr. Miller, Erwin Miller. So she was the primary investigator in charge of this trial within the AHN system. So if you came in, you were a patient of mine, and we offered you this trial, she was the person in our group who was responsible for overseeing the trial to make sure that we did everything by the FDA standards to make sure everything's done safely. The reason why I put that up there too is Dr. Miller's in there, Erwin Miller, but when I went through the, the names, I didn't see anybody from UPMC on there. So if you were treated at HN, and this is, you can laugh, but if you were treated at HN and you got on this trial, you changed the standard of care for women who have advanced cancer of the endometrium. And this is huge. I mean, this is a huge difference. I saw this presentation on a Monday and Tuesday I changed how I practice. It was that quick. Now the insurance company didn't like it because it's an expensive medication. And so they want to fight it a little bit. But when you look at this, this changed the standard of care for how we treat women with endometrial cancer. And so to me, I highlight some of this to show you the complexity about how we get trials. And, and this is not inexpensive. This is a 200 to $300 million trial. That's what these pharmaceutical companies put up. And, and, and to me, I think that that shows their dedication uh, to, to, to the patients because we have not seen these types of results in my 20 years of practicing. I went from doing surgery to, you know, comparing chemo to radiation, you know, and we doing more chemotherapy. Th this here, I've seen patients who, unfortunately, I thought were going to pass away from their uterine cancer that are still alive and cancer free. So, and that was based off the trial before this one. So to me, th this is really, really important. This is why uh, I get up and I love what I do every single day because this has really helped women live much, much longer uh, with endometrial cancer. So we've made a lot of progress with patients with endometrial cancer. Again, what are we gonna do next? Do they even need chemotherapy? So that's the next question. Do you need chemotherapy? Or if you have certain genetic alterations, can you do surgery and immunotherapy? Because chemotherapy does decrease the quality of life. I'm sure many of you in this room that have been on chemotherapy would say it does decrease the quality of life. So how can we improve your quality of life and continue to have good outcomes? And again, introduction of immunotherapy at earlier stage disease. These were patients with stage three, stage four, or patients who had recurrent cancer. Should we use this for patients who have stage one or stage two high-risk subtypes? And again, those trials uh, were, were, were done. And again, looking at this increased efficacy for PMMMR. Again, this is looking in the details. You have deficient MMR tumors, PMMR tumors. That's a biomarker that we look at as, as clinicians to say, how are we gonna treat our patients? So again, it's more individualized care. Any questions about endometrial cancer? Okay, I don't wanna to go too long. Um, I think it's been almost an hour. So I'm gonna cruise through cervical cancer really quick. Not that it's not important, but cervical cancer, um, again, what, what's appropriate for these patients, they need a good detailed examination, they need PET scans, they need expert pathology review as well. Is it cervical cancer, is it endometrial cancer? What type of cervical cancer is it? We need tumor testing because again, we're stratifying how we're testing, uh, treating patients based off a lot of the tumor. Surgery for early stage disease, most women with cervical cancer come in and say, I want it removed. It's not good to cut through cancer when you're cutting through cervical cancer. So early stage disease will do uh, surgery. Later stage disease, you can see we'll do chemo radiation or chemo immunotherapy. And then again, looking at additional treatments, antibody drug conjugates are, 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 very, are, are being investigated as well as cellular therapies. You know, most of this tumor is gonna be HPV dominant. So cellular therapies have really uh, done very, very well 
and have a lot of promise with respect to treatment of this disease. Pap smear testing is very, very important. HPV testing is very, very important. HPV vaccine, I'm not here to talk about vaccines. Both my children were, were, were vaccinated. I do believe in, in vaccinations for HPV. If a woman has cervical dysplasia, I will do a leap or a cone. And then if she's not having a hysterectomy, I'll consider uh, stimulating again with the HPV vaccinations because it decreases the risk of recurrence by about 50%. If, if you don't like vaccines, I support you on that. We have plenty of other ways that we can uh, prevent cancer, again, pap smear, HPV testing. And again, it should be a preventable disease um, with respect to cervical cancer. Again, when you look at the process, um, there's not a lot of genetics uh, in cervical cancer in that um, mom and dad don't pass genes off to kids that can uh, increase their risk. But you do have dysplasia. You know, we have the pap smear that, you know, pap smears are there to detect precancerous changes, the cervical dysplasia. Uh, for that. And again, cervical dysplasia, low grade, high grade, moderate. We kind of look at those different classifications and then it goes from pre-malignant to malignant. And again, treatment of cervical cancer. And so to me, um, what I would say is the majority of women that have cervical cancer have not undergone uh, pap smear testing. Pap smears are not perfect. Screening tests are not perfect. So uh, I do see patients every now and then that have been completely vaccinated had pap smears and unfortunately still develop this disease. That's why it's important to go for your pap smear, even if you've been vaccinated as well as to make sure and, and undergo an examination. So this is a, a trial that was reported at ASCO as well. And again, you can see pembrolizumide or Keytruda um, it plus chemotherapy for patients with uh, recurrent or metastatic cervical cancer. And again, this combined chemotherapy with immunotherapy as well as antigenic therapy, and then after the chemotherapy portion, you continued on either the immunotherapy or the immunotherapy with bevacizumab, the antigenic therapy for a defined period of time. And again, you can see that these clinical trials are, are designed, um, again, persistent or recurrent. You have to have a good functional status that tells you how healthy you are. And again, these stratification factors, just like I showed in the other trial, we look at different stratification factors because everybody's tumors are a little bit different and every patient's a little bit different, but you can see you know, looking at this PDL1 status. And that is a biomarker that may tell us how well immunotherapy works in patients with, with cervical cancer. And again, you can see it's a large number of patients, 620 patients. And again, it took two years to accrue uh, for, for, for the patients um, to, to try to get enough patients to help look at the different uh, outcomes. And again, you can see here that we look at very different things, the different stages, because patients are going to have recurrent. We look at different um, recurrences uh, versus distant metastases. We look at prior angiogenic therapy. We look at prior radiation therapy, because again, we talked about how radiation therapy may affect immunotherapy. And so we look at all these to make sure that when the company goes to the FDA, that we've encompassed basically any type of clinical patient that we'll see coming into our office to make sure that they can go ahead and qualify for the study or qualify for the medications. And again, um, the upper line is patients who receive chemotherapy with immunotherapy. The bottom line is patients who receive chemotherapy with uh, a placebo or bevacizumab. Now, again, you heard me say earlier that patients didn't receive a placebo. And now you're saying, wait a second, Tom, you just lied. These patients received a placebo. I lied. No, I didn't lie. These patients received a placebo with the immunotherapy, but they still received chemotherapy and bevacizumab because the standard of care if you didn't come to an institution that didn't have this trial, if you went to just a, 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 an institution in Clearfield, Pennsylvania that said, okay, what's, what's the standard of care? You're gonna get chemotherapy with bevacizumab. You're not gonna get the trial, which was seeing does the addition of immunotherapy potentiate that, okay? So, so to me, you're still getting treatment, but yes, you did get a placebo, but you're not getting placebo, you're getting active treatment. And what this trial found out is, is that by adding the immunotherapy, again, you had a better outcome. Very similar to what we saw with respect to, to endometrial cancer. So to me, I wish I had this data for ovarian cancer. Unfortunately, we just don't just yet. Immunotherapy's made great strides with respect to uh, cervical cancer as well as, 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 as um, endometrial cancer. Um, and again, you can see here 151 sites, 19 countries. So you can see in order for us to achieve a goal of 675 patients, um, you know, 151 sites. So that's right around four to five patients per site. Uh, so you can see it's not a very common disease. So if we didn't have all these sites open, we wouldn't be able to get the clinical trials done. 
looking at uh, cervical cancer, again, I think that immunotherapy is a very, very important part of that. And if patients come in to get treated, uh, a lot are going to receive chemoimmunotherapy now. This trial changed the standard of care. The um, FDA limited it to the patients who are CPS 1%. Uh, percent. And basically what that means is we need to test your tumor. And if you're greater than 1% of having this antibody, you qualify for, for, for requiring immunotherapy and immunotherapy worked well. If you didn't have that CPS score of one, the immunotherapy did not show benefit. And again, by, by radiation, how does radiation therapy and immunotherapy work together? Again, we think that it kind of destroys the cancer cells, make them look much more abnormal to stimulate your immune system. I've had patients who have had uh, immunotherapy, they've had recurrence, give them radiation, retreat them with immunotherapy and their cancer goes away. We do think that there's some type of effect that will help with that. And you can see this antigen release is really what we think is key that helps the, the uh, cancer cells look tremendously abnormal. And again, here's the different other pathways with respect to radiation. So combination of chemotherapy and immunotherapy, radiation treatments and immunotherapy are very, very important. Kala study, this is looking at upfront uh, cervical cancer, I've showed you two positive clinical trials. This unfortunately was not positive. It was looking at immunotherapy with radiation treatments for patients who have stage three or stage um, stage three or um, locally advanced endometrial or, uh, cervical cancer. Um, and it was a surprise because I think most of us thought that with this, we were gonna see an improvement in progression free and overall survival, but it did not. You can see here that again, the rates of survival were somewhere between the, the, the two groups, but we're still investigating to see how we can um, uh, improve the survival for patients who present with upfront local advanced cervical cancer. So I know that we covered a lot today, um, this evening, but I think, you know, take home is it, it, it takes a team. It's a group of people. It's, it's the surgeons, it's, it's the medical oncologists, it's the nurses, it's the nurse navigators, it's the uh, genetic counselors. We're really fortunate in that, um, you know, if you saw me at St. Vincent's, you know that you're going to see myself, you know, Christy, the PA, uh, Sherry Madonna. Uh, we're going to be able to get you referred to, to, to Dr. Rizwan, to, to, to Dr. Tichetti. Um, you know, the genetic counselors will be able to call you and do things over the phone. It really does take a team. Um, and that's very, very important. Um, again, Testing the tumor, I think, is important. Genetic testing is very important. My personal bias is, again, you can see maintenance therapy uh, for patients with ovarian cancer, and maintenance therapy is after the initial chemotherapy. Again, PARP inhibitors were leading the change and still are for ovarian cancer. If somebody has a stage three or stage four ovarian cancer, those patients are going to get treated with chemotherapy as well as a PARP inhibitor um, if they're being treated by myself. Immunotherapy is really, really important for uterine cancer. It has changed the standard of care for women with uterine cancer. It's changed the standard of care for patients with cervical cancer. Again, we're looking at multiple different biologic agents in future clinical trials. Uh, we have a, a whole host at, at AHN that, that are very novel. It's disappointing. The last four or five clinical trials for ovarian cancer that have been interpretative have not shown an improvement. So we're going back to the drawing board and, and seeing what we can do to improve, uh, see if it was a medication or if it was a design trial, um, but, but we need to continue to do that. And again, novel approaches to improving uh, cytotoxic agents are under investigation. So we actually have a trial where we're biopsying tumors uh, with ovarian cancer, we're looking at certain phosphorylation. You heard me talk about methylation, but phosphorylation can turn off certain pathways and we're basing their chemotherapy based upon that phosphorylation. So patients are having to go through additional biopsies, but this is looking at a different cellular pathway to do that. Again, showing some of the team, the NOCC, um, again, um, Amy B and, and, and Aaron. Amy B uh, kind of runs the office down in Pittsburgh. She answers the phone probably 99% of the time. Um, She's always emailing me about making sure I have enough appointments because, you know, I like to golf and all that kind of good stuff. So she's making sure I, I'm working. And then Aaron is in charge of our clinical trials. The NOCC is a national, I think, ovarian cancer coalition. Uh, we have the survivor's tent. There's a lot of survivors there. But again, I, I think our office is, is absolutely wonderful in that they all volunteer to get out to try to support the patients at, at, at fundraisers such as the walk. And really the NOCC is there to provide information to patients and patients' family. Uh, and I do think they really help getting patients to the right doctors, because I think having the right team of doctors is very, very important. Um, and this is Pittsburgh. You know, I moved uh, to Pittsburgh. I'm not a Pittsburgh kid. I grew up in the Akron Cleveland area, was in the military, so I was on both coasts. Um, I never thought I would live in Pittsburgh. I said, I'm going to be in Pittsburgh for three years, and then I'm going to move back to DC and work at the NCI or go back to California, work at UCSF 
And um, I just fell in love with uh, Pittsburgh and, and the city. And uh, I just think it's, uh, it's the greatest place going. So you guys need to give me a picture of Erie because I like coming up here. You guys have Presque Isle and I can, it's just, it's just a beautiful place. Even in the winter, I don't mind snow. I love coming up here in the winter. Drive takes a little bit longer, but uh, it's always enjoyable. So um, I appreciate your time. I appreciate you trusting us at AHN. Um, I think we have a great team. Um, I'm very fortunate to work with the people I work with at St. Vincent's as well as at uh, West Penn, as well as within AHN. So any questions at this time? Dr. Krivak, hey. it's Crystal Ross. Um, Hi, Crystal. We really appreciate the um, presentation tonight and really would like to thank all the people who have attended the Ahead of Cancer Lecture Series event. Please continue to join us at monthly Ahead of Cancer Lecture Series as we focus on cancer screening, detection, treatment, and survivorship. As a reminder, tonight's lecture was recorded. If you are interested in re-watching the lecture, please check back on the AHN YouTube channel for the full recording. This video, as well as other past lectures, will be posted under the Ahead of Cancer playlist. If you'd like to schedule an appointment or have questions regarding a potential cancer concern, please call the Hope Line at 412-578-6473 to schedule an appointment. You may also call our 24-hour Nurse for You line at 412-687-4968. Thank you again so much, Dr. Krivak, and thanks to all who attended the, the talk this evening. Thank you.